So here I'm going to talk about the four market structures that you'll see in a Principles of Microeconomics class. Now, it depends on the class. A lot of times uh, instructors only get through the first two, and that's the most important because you can kind of come up with the most important conclusions just from those two. It depends on, on how fast you go or what other topics you talk about before you get there. Right. Now, what market structure is, it basically has to do with how the product being sold and produced is, structure, is uh, put together. So um, some things are more competitive than others. For example, it's, it might be easier to start a restaurant um, than it would be to start a, you know, a cell phone company because you got to you know, dig cables or launch satellites or something. So, so nobody's going to start their own uh, you know, mobile provider network, but you could theoretically start your own restaurant. Now, a lot of times competition is reduced through laws, like, you know, some you know, you just can't start selling food because you got to pass health code and stuff. And sometimes those laws are actually used to keep competition out. Right? So we're kind of assuming that that um, it's the natural structure of, of each business that makes it more or less competitive. All right. So that comes down to just differences in the type of, of business. Um, now, what I usually say it has to do with, with the availability of substitutes. All right. Um, so if I start a restaurant, I have to worry about other competing you know, businesses that sell the same type of food, or people might just want to go to a restaurant and I have to compete with anything out there. Now, perfect competition is more theoretical, but that's assuming that every business is completely substitutable with everybody else. Now, if you're a monopoly, there's literally no competitors. So either those are the two extremes. Either everything's a substitute or nothing's a substitute, but reality is kind of in between. So... Once you think about what each type of business is like, and again, each business is different, each product is different, or each service is different, and you can make changes, you know, you can try to make your business seem like there's no competition and you stand out, or sometimes laws can be used to reduce competition as well. So you can think about each business, you can think about the type of business. All right, but then when you think about the effect on the different groups in economics, you can think about the effects, first of all, on prices and quantity produced. So you can say, well, what are the differences in how much things cost? Does competition make things more expensive? Does competition make things easier to get? Maybe competition reduces prices, all else equal. You, then you can also think about each group you know, in terms of welfare. So you can say, well, business profits might be higher if there's less competition, and consumers might be better off if there's more competition. But then when you think of those two groups together, you can think of overall welfare. And one thing you see is that the lack of competition increases deadweight loss, right? Reduces welfare to society. So that's kind of the big takeaway. Even if you get through the first two only, competition is good. Lack of competition helps the producer, hurts the consumer. But sometimes people take that really far. They assume that it applies to every business. But really, you want to look at each business in real life, thinking about, you know, how two clothing companies might be sort of competitive, sort of not competitive. Um, because if you just assume everything's perfect competition, you might wind up making the wrong decision, right? So what you normally do is you look at the formulas for the pricing decision. You basically, quantity is chosen based on two formulas. For competition, it's price equals marginal cost. For monopoly, it's marginal revenue equals marginal cost. You look at the graphs, and you can look at the welfare in terms of triangles and rectangles, and then you can apply that to real businesses. And that's kind of important because, because if you do go into business, you really have to do think about, you really do have to think about your competitors. You really do have to think about how it stands out. And I tell students, if you're looking for a job, you know, starting out of college, you might have you might be one of many. You might not have much market power. You might not be able to to set your own price. But but the more experience you get, you might actually be able to make your own, you know, have some bargaining power. It's never perfect, but but the less competition, the better bargaining power you would have as a seller. Right? So the four market structures are perfect competition and monopoly. Those are the most important two. Oligopoly is interesting um, because you could talk about conspiracy theories, game theory. You could talk about cartels and stuff. Um, I, I do actually talk about prisoner's dilemma in class. Um, the monopolistic competition is the most uh, realistic because most firms are somewhat competitive, but somewhat also they try to be unique in their own way. So uh, that difference, how close they are to either perfect competition or monopoly kind of gives them that intermediate range where they, they kind of have uh, characteristics of both. Right. So usually you start with perfect competition. This is an extreme case, and really it might only apply to agriculture because if you grow potatoes, for example, there's nothing that separates your potatoes from someone else. Right? And, and literally uh, farmers have no market power. They take the prices given in the markets. Um, so agricultural products is one thing you never see individual potatoes marketed, and usually it's done as a consortium um, because no individual farmer has power.
Right. Same thing uh, for, for other crops as well. So that's maybe where it fits, but again, it's an extreme case. And so, so never take the extreme case and apply it to all life. You know, uh, try, try to match reality to your specific situation. And, um, all right, so uh, the, the characteristics, remember that you can make a chart with characteristics. Uh, infinite, identical, small sellers, nobody stands out. Um, everybody's so tiny, they're basically like a dot on the line. All right. No, there's infinitely small and there's infinitely many. Easy entry and exit. There's no barriers. Anybody can go into business if they want to or go out of business if they have to. Uh, people are price takers. They take the market as given. And so here's the market that sets the price here. And then that's the whole market. And then one tiny firm, one tiny dot in the market takes the price as given. And they can produce as much as they want at that price. They can produce zero. They can produce as much as they want to. And remember, economics is about knowing when to stop. Why would you just keep producing? Well, because remember, there's costs. So eventually the cost will, won't be worth it anymore, so you'll stop. But you cannot set the price. The price is given by the market. Now, if the whole market changes, it changes events for the individual firm. So it, this is infinitely elastic demand. It's a perfectly flat demand curve. You cannot raise the price. Raising the price even by a penny means you lose all your business to one of your many competitors. And of course you won't want to lose, you, you would not want to lower your price because you don't want to lose a penny, right? So you take this price as given and you, you do not have the power to set the price. Big players can. If you're a big player and you produce more, you're going to push the price down. If you hold back, you can push the price up. But you do not have this power. So you can do, let's say, an increase in supply. It's going to push the price down. And then the new price for this firm is given. And you find that when you talk about the long run. I'm going to talk mostly about the short run right here. But in the long run, this is going to... If there's profits to be made, people will enter the market. It's going to push prices down, and only the cheapest, and by cheapest, I mean lowest cost, right? They're not producing an inferior product. But the lowest cost producers are still around, which is going to be good for consumers because you don't want to overpay for a product if someone else can do it more efficiently, right? But how does this price get pushed down? It gets pushed down by increase in the market. Now, same thing goes up if there's an increase, right? Um, you, it will push the price up as well. All right. Now, the pricing decision is, well, how much along all here can they produce? Or how much should they produce? What's the profit maximizing quantity for this firm? And the formula that you've seen is price equals marginal cost. Okay, so you don't set it above because you can't, and, and um, you, you can't set it below. So what does this mean? Well, first of all, marginal costs are rising. Here's the price, which is fixed. So this is, this is also the price. Remember what you've seen before when you talk about the cost-benefit curve? Okay. If you produce more, costs are high. You're actually costing more to produce than you're receiving. This is not profitable. But at the same time, if you're underproducing, this is a profit. You want to expand your profits just to the point where there's zero. If you go further, you're going to start to lose money. Okay. And then if you think about this as marginal revenue, sometimes this is P equals MC equals MR. Every one unit you sell earns you exactly the price. Right? It's, it's, it's constant right? because it's not an upward sloping or downward sloping curve. Okay, so you produce more, you make the revenue, but here the revenue is less than the cost. You want to do that. Okay, so this is the optimal point, just like in any cost benefit graph. Okay, now if you look at perfect competition uh, in the cost curve sense, you would say that, well, first of all, this is the average cost curve. Okay, and this remember this intersects, I didn't quite line it up right, usually it should cross a little bit better, but the point is, is that. If you have average costs, right, if you produce at this quantity, one thing to remember is that total cost is average cost times Q. If you rearrange it, you might have seen it as average cost is total divided by Q. This just algebraically moves it over. Right? So the idea is that at this quantity, there's this one specific cost right here, and you can make a rectangle out of it. This is average cost times quantity, and you can make a box, right, in red here that is the average cost cost, right? So this is the, the total cost, excuse me. This is the total cost. Average cost at a certain height times the quantity produced at a certain base. Now, PQ is the revenue, right? So, so this is the price sold, and for every unit sold, they earn this much money that makes a rectangle. So these rectangles represent amounts of money. This is your revenue, this is your cost, and this little sliver that's left over is your profit, okay? Now, what happens if the market changes? Well, if, if we in introduce that supply increase again, more people enter the market. And again, this is, might be because they see those profits and they want some of them. It's going to push the price down. And as that happens, it's going to lower not only the price, 
but also the quantity because the new crossing points is going to be a little over to the left. So the revenue is going to be smaller. Again, those extra people entering the market are going to squeeze out that firm. There's more people producing the product and your little share is going to shrink. So you're going to get less quantity and also a lower price. And the little sliver is a little bit smaller. And it could go to zero if you if it goes down even further, you might have no profits at all. And if it keeps going, you start to lose money and you might be pushed out of business. And the only people left are the people who can do the job more cheaply, less expensive than you. Okay, So you might shut down if your variable costs are not covered. So that's the idea. You see that these boxes represent revenues and costs. The quantity is chosen where P equals MC. And you can get revenue and cost and profit. Okay, the Profits can be large. In which case, competition will increase and get rid of those profits, and that's why people like perfect competition. Right? There's no profits to be had in the long run. Okay? Now we compare this to monopoly, and this is also the extreme case. Right? There are very few monopolies in the world, but a lot of times there is limited competition. Right? There's one large seller. It's difficult to enter or exit. It could be a natural monopoly. You control a specific resource, or it could be a high fixed cost, like building cell phone towers is really expensive but building roads and stuff. A lot of times these are produced by the government because it's so hard to compete or they're heavily regulated, right? Um, so a lot of these industries have, have more government control. It's a price maker, not a price taker, because the more you sell, you're going to push the price down. Marginal revenue declines twice as fast as demand. You can show that with calculus, but and basically uh, and you can do numbers as well, which I do elsewhere. But marginal revenue is going to hit zero, and it's going to hit zero before demand does. Okay. The profit maximizing quantity is marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That is actually not the price. Some students think the price is here. This is the cost. The price is on the demand curve, meaning this much is going to be profit, and it's going to be profit for all the uh, quantity sold. Okay, So you can get profit the same way, and you can also get dead weight loss, which is the lost efficiency to society. Anytime a transaction does not take place, both sides lose. Something people wanted isn't bought and something people wanted to make isn't sold. So utility and profits are lost, okay? So uh, the, pr the price is up here. The difference between price and cost is this. This is your profit. And because of the lost transactions, this is uh, the dead weight loss. So this is actually worse for society. But this shows that price is greater than MR equals MC. So essentially, the monopoly is able to cut back so that they don't push the price down too much, keep the price high because they control the market, and then because they sell at a high price, they're able to get higher profits as a result. And then consumers usually lose in terms of overpaying, but then a lot of times you see they get worse customer service and stuff like that. So generally speaking, the government might want to break up a monopoly, introduce competition, or, or at least regulate that monopoly. Okay. So prices are higher and quantities are lower in monopoly. Like I mentioned, long run perfect competition, there's no profits. The price will go to the minimum average total cost, and that's it. It can't fall lower because everybody will go out of business. Society's welfare is higher. There's no deadweight loss. This, this is actually, uh, profit is actually transferred partially from consumers, but this is lost entirely, okay? So that's kind of the big takeaway is that competition is better in those senses, but more realistic is monopolistic competition. There's some power over prices. There's limited substitution. It's kind of in between. You can uh, Elsewhere, you might be able to see a table where you can compare. A perfect competition has more easy entry. Monopolistic competition might have some barriers. It, it's in between in a lot of cases. It does have its own graphs, which I usually don't cover, but you can actually see that it's, it, it's, it's got the cost curves, but they're, they're a little bit less competitive, a little bit more like monopoly. Uh, but this applies to a large number of businesses, right? Businesses do have to think about competitors, but they do think about how they have a, a kind of a little bit of market power, right? You are not, you know, you don't see a store that says clothing, right? Everybody's got their own brand. And you, you might have your own competitors within your brand, but you're not it, it just one, on, you know, one out of a bazillion firms, right? So, so usually there's some competition, some ability to set the price, some, you know, characteristics of both. All right, now oligopoly is interesting in its own right. Uh, usually I kind of treat it like a separate topic. You could have a few firms controlling a common resource. Oil is one. People talk about you know, potassium and other stuff. Um, but there's a lot you can do with strategy. You can talk about who moves first, who's a price leader. You could talk about like Stackelberg or oligopoly and stuff like that. But I usually don't. The one thing I usually like to talk about is prisoner's dilemma. Basically, the lack of coordination leads to the worst outcome for both parties. Um, and you can have, in a, in a market, you might have oversupply because right? they're not coordinating, they both overproduce, or you might have the price set too low. You can talk about cartels, which are arrangements which set an oligopoly and agree to, to fix prices or to control quantities. 
again, you can talk about arms races and, and all sorts of stuff. And it's, own, it's that's kind of its own topic. So generally speaking, I know I cover a little bit more. I talk about other topics. I cover all four market structures. I talk about international trade and stuff. Sometimes instructors do run out of time at the end and their final exam goes up to monopoly. So make sure you understand the differences between perfect competition and monopoly. Partially because the graphs are the most important, you should be able to choose the quantity, choose the price, show the welfare, compare both. But there's also this idea that conceptually or like philosophically, you can talk about the role of competition in terms of welfare for consumers and, and welfare for society. So focusing on perfect competition monopoly, I've got some numbers I've set up in a different video. You can actually calculate and show how those two market structures compare.